Magic Tree House, Super Edition, Book Number One, World at War, 1944, by Mary Pope Osborne. Chapter 14, The Pilot. Soon after the silver plane crossed the English Channel, it landed silently in the field near Glastonbury Tor. Teddy opened the rear door and lowered the step ladder. Everyone out, he said. Once again, the big kids helped the little kids. Everyone climbed down the ladder and stepped onto the dark, dewy grass. The moon was high in the sky now. Jack could hardly believe that he and Annie had only been away from England and home for 24 hours. The SOE has arranged to take everyone to London, Teddy said to Kathleen. Motor cars are waiting in the parking lot. This way. As Teddy led the group toward the parking lot, Annie carried Daniel and Eddie, and Jack carried Leo and Ellie. Where are we going? Ellie asked him. To a safe city, answered Jack. You'll live in a nice house soon, I promise. The small boy kissed Jack on the cheek. Then Leo kissed Jack too. Jack just laughed. You guys are funny, he said. Is Jack your brother? Eddie asked Annie. Yes, said Annie. He's my brother. Is he the best brother in the world? Asked the tiny girl. Yes, he is, said Annie. Are you and Annie coming with us? Ellie asked Jack. No, we have to go back to America now, said Jack. How will you get there? asked Leo. In a magic tree house, said Jack. Can we play in your tree house someday? asked Leo. Absolutely, said Jack. When you come to America, you can do anything you want. Three big black cars were waiting in the parking lot beside the airfield. Teddy got four of the children settled in the first car, and Jack and Annie tucked their four into the second car. See ya, guys, Jack said. Be good. Jack closed the door and stood in the dark with Annie and Teddy, as Kathleen guided Sophie and Sarah to the third car in the lot. Before they reached it, the doors opened, and a man and woman climbed out. They were tall and well-dressed. When the man and woman saw Sophie and Sarah, they both burst into sobs. The man knelt and held out his arms. My babies, he said, grabbing Sophie and Sarah and pulling them close. Sophie and Sarah started crying too. Papa, Mama, Papa, Mama. For a long time, Sophie, Sarah, and their parents all held each other and cried. They were still holding on to each other as they stumbled back to their car and climbed into the back seat together. Jack felt tears on his cheeks. Kathleen and Annie were sniffling. Annie cleared his throat and clapped his hands together. Victory, he said. Victory, said Jack, smiling. Then he held up two fingers. What about Ellie and Eddie and Leo and all the other kids? Annie asked Kathleen. What will happen to them? The SOE will locate their relatives and friends to care for them, said Kathleen. I will go to London and protect them until they are all safely placed in happy homes. Thank you for saving them, said Annie. Thank you, Annie, said Kathleen for remaining hopeful and helping make a plan when we were almost ready to give up. No problem, said Annie. Together, you and Jack saved their lives and mine, said Kathleen. You are my heroes. Jack shrugged. I'm not a hero, he said. Kathleen took Jack's hand. She looked into his eyes. You are a hero, Jack. Believe me. And you are a wonderful truck driver, too. Jack laughed. Kathleen smiled her radiant smile. Well, until we meet again, farewell, she said. Teddy, are you coming? Yes, I will join you for the ride to London, Teddy said. Wait for me. Good, 
Kathleen blew Jack and Danny a kiss. Then she climbed into the first car. Teddy turned to them. If you have a minute before you leave, the pilot of the plane would like to see you. He said, "Great," said Jack. He had lots of questions for that SOE pilot, like what kind of plane was he flying. Teddy, Jack, and Annie hurried away from the parking lot across the grounds of the ancient abbey. In the moonlight, Jack looked back at the landing field. The silver plane wasn't there. Where did it go? He asked, hurrying alongside Teddy. The plane. Ah, yes, the plane is gone, but the pilot remains behind. Teddy said mysteriously. Come with me. Through the misty air, they passed the glistening pond and the sheep asleep in the grass. Just beyond a hedgerow were the ruins of pillars and archways. There, on that bench, said Teddy. Jack could barely make out a person sitting on a stone bench. The person's back was to them, and he was wearing a dark cloak. Oh, Annie said with a grin. Got it. Got what? Said Jack. Got the whole thing. Said Annie. I just figured it out. She hurried to the bench and sat next to the man in the cloak. The next moment, they were talking softly together. The man had a deep voice. Whoa! Said Jack. Suddenly, he got it too. He walked over and sat down next to Annie and the man. Hi, Merlin. Jack said as casually as he could. Good evening, Jack. Merlin said. The magician was wearing a black cloak with the cowl over his head. His long white beard shone in the moonlight. So Teddy sent for you, Jack asked. Yes, said Merlin. And you knew how to find and fly a special military plane, said Jack. No, said the magician of Camelot. I knew how to conjure a special plane to suit your needs, one that could carry fourteen passengers and take off and land without being seen or heard. Cool, Jack murmured, still trying to sound cool. I know this was an especially difficult mission for you, said Merlin. You experienced firsthand what it means to live in constant terror. Yes, said Jack. You know what it feels like to be afraid to speak or move about freely," said Merlin. "We do," said Annie. "You have seen cruel people hunt down the innocent, even children," said Merlin. Jack and Annie nodded. "But you overcame your fears in order to accomplish your mission," said Merlin. Teddy found two excellent recruits in the fight for freedom. There is no way I can adequately thank you, but allow me to try. Thank you, both of you, and I hope to see you again soon. You too," said Annie. "Any time," said Jack. Merlin stood up from the bench. "Well, goodbye," he said. "Have a safe trip home." "Bye," said Annie. Jack and Annie watched the master magician. Walk off into the night and disappear like smoke among the ruins. Wow, Annie breathed. Wow, indeed," said Teddy, stepping from the shadows. Now, are you ready to go home? Jack and Annie stood up from the bench and followed Teddy to the tree house. Teddy's large duffel bag sat at the base of the tree. Teddy reached in and pulled out their sneakers and Jack's pack. You can have your things back now. He said, "Thanks," said Jack, "and you can have your things back too." Jack and Annie pulled off their farm boots, overalls, and shirts. Jack shivered in his shorts and t-shirt as he and Annie changed into their sneakers and tied the laces. Then Jack took his pencil and notebook out of the field pack and handed the pack to Teddy. "Thanks for lending this to us," he said. "You are welcome." Said Teddy, "I will have to make up a good story for Winston about how I got all of you out of France. But now I had better catch my ride to London. Until next time, cheerio, chaps. Cheerio, chap." Jack and Danny said together. "Onward," said Teddy. 
Then he slung his duffel bag over his shoulder and headed toward the parking lot. Jack and Danny watched Teddy march briskly toward the hedgerow. Just before he rounded the corner, he turned and gave them a salute. Then he was gone. Jack and Danny climbed the rope ladder into the tree house. Annie grabbed the Pennsylvania book. Ready, she said. Wait. Jack heard the steady hum of planes overhead. He and Danny looked up at the night sky and saw distant lights. I wonder if those are D-Day planes, Annie said. Yeah, I wonder if they're heading to Normandy, said Jack. The planes kept moving through the night sky. More planes and more and more. It's time for us to go home, said Annie. Definitely, said Jack. Annie pointed to a photo of the Frog Creek Woods. I wish we could go there, she said. The wind started to blow. The treehouse started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still. Absolutely still. Frog Creek was warm in the summer sunset. Jack breathed in the smell of dry wood and green leaves. He felt as if he had never smelled anything so good and so safe. Nice, said Annie. Jack just nodded. His heart was heavy, too heavy to talk about all they'd seen and done. He picked up his backpack and climbed down the rope ladder. Annie followed. In silence, they started through the late summer woods crossing in and out of dark shadows. War really is a terrible thing, Annie said finally. Jack nodded. I don't understand it, said Annie. Why would anyone want to hurt people like Sophie and Sarah and their parents, or Tom and Theo, or the old man at the chain station? I don't know, said Jack. And how could anyone want to hurt those little kids, said Annie. What if the Nazis had caught Leo and Ellie and all the others? Jack shuddered. It was unbearable to think about. Germany, England, France, Italy, and the United States. They all work together now for peace in the world, right? Said Annie. Right, said Jack. They're all good friends. And the United States and Japan also fought each other in World War II, said Annie. But now they're good friends. Right, said Jack. Cool, said Annie. Let's think about that instead. And let's think about Gaston, Suzette, Sylvie, Tom, Theo, and the driver of the milk truck, all trying to do the right thing. During war, I think lots of people try to do the right thing. Don't you? Yes, said Jack. Jack and Annie left the shadowy woods and crossed their street to the bright, sunshiny sidewalk. The warmth and beauty of the light lifted Jack's spirits. I love our lives, Annie said with a sigh. Yeah, me too, said Jack, especially our freedom. Like the freedom to ride our bikes to the lake and the library, said Annie. The freedom to watch movies and eat popcorn and play Scrabble with mom and dad and cook outside on the grill and visit our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Yeah, a million things like that, said Jack. Right now, he had a whole new appreciation for the familiar, ordinary things in life. Jack and Danny turned into their yard and climbed the steps to the front porch. Before Jack opened the screen door, he looked at Annie. Hey, did you think the airplane pilot would turn out to be Merlin? He asked. No way. I definitely did not see that coming, said Annie. Did you? Not in a million years, Jack said with a grin. Then he headed inside their house.